Do you seek the freedom to pursue greater meaning and purpose in your life? Is there something that you're passionate about that you'd like to support by giving time, talent, or money? Do you seek a level of financial freedom to live an ideal life as you uniquely define it? Welcome to the Money and Meaning Show with Jeff Bernier, a show dedicated to helping you gain the confidence and freedom to lead a life of personal significance and help you get your actions and resources in alignment with what matters most. Hello and welcome to the Money and Meaning Show. My name is Jeff Bernier. I am your host and guide as we have periodic conversations around money and meaning. And what we want to do in these shows is have a deep discussion around what gives you joy in your life, what gives you meaning, um, what gives you purpose, uh, and how do we put financial plans in place to give you the freedom and the capacity to go pursue your vision of a meaningful life. You know, I've become really interested in the last several years on some of the happiness literature. So there's a lot of body of research around what makes people happy. And consistently in this data is that once we reach a certain level of financial security, more money doesn't necessarily make people happier. But what does appear to make people happier are relationships, experiences, and purpose. So today's show is all about experiences. And just recently, um, Ben Carlson on his blog, A Wealth of Common Sense, he talked about how experiences might even be more important in the world that we currently live in, because we work remotely, many of us. We're disconnected from human beings more than we've ever been. Not only that, we have a whole generation of young people that are growing up in a digital world where a lot of their relationships are through uh, digital formats. And so getting out in the world and experiencing things uh, might be even more important than it's ever been. So I'm really excited to have a guest on today that can help us sort of balance out some of these choices around how do we build a career and build a life while at the same time investing in some really, really unique experiences. So please welcome today, Rachel Levine. I've got Rachel on today. She is a partner and senior advisor at Potoma Capital Partners. Uh, Rachel lives in Austin, Texas with her husband, Alex. They're Australian sheepdog Dax. And uh, what's interesting about Rachel is after a, a decade of financial experience, she leveraged her experience in the financial world and basically took an adult gap year. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but before she joined Potoma as a wealth advisor, uh, she was a regional director at Dimensional Fund Advisors. And as you know, we've had a lot of people from Dimensional on our show from time to time. Uh, so Rachel is an avid traveler, passionate about empowering others to experience the world more deeply. So she's traveled to 36 countries and counting. Uh, she's championed the benefits of sabbaticals remote work, and long-term travel experiences. Uh, I found out about Rachel through her blog, uh, which is trippingmillennial.com, uh, where the purpose of her blog, at least on her blog, she says, is to share no BS trips, I'm sorry, no BS tips and recommendations that help you travel better, cheaper, and more authentically. Uh, so Rachel uh, graduated magnum cum laude from uh, the University of Texas, uh, again, earning a, a BS in finance uh, before she joined Dimensional and a long career there, and then took this adult gap year, I guess, and then back now into the wealth management state space. So without further ado, please welcome my friend, Rachel. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Hey, Jeff, I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this, about this conversation. I think this might be uh, a lot of fun, uh, and I think our audience will really enjoy it especially those of us that are trying to balance uh, work uh, and family and experiences. And so uh, I know that you, you know, you've been experimenting a lot over, over your career with all of these things. So, but I love to start by just getting to know you a little bit and let the audience get to know you a little bit. So do you mind just telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your family? And um, I hit it very briefly, but a little bit about your career path. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I think you hit on some of the high points in the intro, but 
My name's Rachel. I live in Austin. I'm 30 years old. Uh, I live here with my husband and our dog. And I uh, kind of live this double life right now of being a travel and money creator and doing all the things on social media and blogging and newsletter, uh, but then also connecting that to my day job, which is being a partner and senior advisor at Peltoma, which is this startup boutique financial planning practice that's remote first, but based in Austin, where I live. Yeah. And um, what's interesting about those two sides of me is that they do kind of represent what I feel is kind of my purpose, which is to talk about how there's this really interesting intersection of money and experiences and travel, and really how can we use our money to live our most fulfilled lives, mm. kind of what I've been pursuing throughout my life. Um, and that didn't come from a lifetime of travel. In fact, I didn't really travel at all growing up. I had a very modest middle-class upbringing in Louisiana. Um, very happy family life, but we just kind of stuck to our home. We didn't have a lot of money to travel. And so as I grew up and had more financial independence, that's where I kind of got my first taste. My first airplane ride wasn't until I was in my teens. My first uh, international country visit wasn't until I was uh, over the age of 18. So once I kind of got a taste of that, I was hooked. And to your point, now I've been to over 30 countries and um, I'm, I'm still eager for more. I still try and travel as much as I can. Wow. Yeah. Well, it it's uh, you made up for lost time. You know, yeah. you didn't take your first airplane ride till the teens, and and now at thirty, you've traveled to, to over over thirty countries. And I know you also um, mentioned that you you know with your with your career, you've been able to work remotely a lot as well. And you just touched on my next question a little bit. So let's delve into it a little bit more. So one of my all time favorite quotes, I actually put this quote in my book, is from. Uh, Howard Thurman, and he says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs are people whose hearts have come alive. And I think you just mentioned a little hint of that about your purpose, because I kind of think this question just sort of tees up, you know, what is your why? What is your purpose? And I know for me, um, it has evolved a little bit over time. Uh, but can you speak a little bit more about that? So what what gets you jazzed? What what gives you what gets you, what are you passionate about? Well, like you, Jeff, it's evolved for sure, and I think it maybe relates a little bit to um, kind of like the the levels of hierarchy and our, our needs as human beings. Like for me, my why and in, in various degrees throughout my life has really been about money, hmm. um, for better or worse. <laughs> money is kind of kind of been the center of my life. And I think right. that started from a young age when I had a lot of stress about money, um, kind of probably a bit personal, but it's like my dad was an entrepreneur. I kind of saw the swings of how things mm. can be really good and then pretty yeah. bad. And and I think uh, as from a young age, I, I really craved stability. And to me, stability was money. Right. I just wanted to have kind of that that need taken care of. And so for a long time, that was my why. I just wanted to have financial stability. And then once I reached that level, then I realized, okay, what do I do with this stability? How do I, how do I use this money to achieve my, my greatest sense of self-fulfillment? Mm. And what I realized is that some of the things that I thought would bring me happiness and fulfillment, like the new car or the designer clothes or, you know, rattle off whatever, like interesting material, Amazon possession, whatever here and there. None of those things really brought me that lasting sense of like satisfaction and happiness. And what did was experiences. And I know for a lot of people, that's kind of like a duh thing to say, like, especially <laughs> as a millennial, I think millennials have really shown that we tend to prefer experiences over things. That's like a huge part of what I like to talk about and write about. And so now when I think about my why, it really is trying to connect, how can we use money to live a bigger life, a more adventurous life? And what's that? what that often translates to is travel for me, of course, because what I like to talk about is travel. And so those are the experiences that I think really set me on fire. Right. But to be truthful, it really is any experience. You know, in, it could be in your own hometown. It doesn't really matter. It's just how do we use our money to live a life that is more rich in experiences rather than things? Yeah. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it may it makes perfect sense too, as you have orchestrated a career that gives you a great deal of freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so this sounds like it was really planned out and intentional, but was it? I mean, was your career path out of out of uh University of Texas? It was dimensional your first job out of college? It was. Yeah. yeah. So so you left you, you left Texas, went to Dimensional, which has, you know, a big giant organization with a lot of hierarchies of processes and people and administrative um requirements, I guess. Uh and then and then taking your and taking your gap and now back into the wealth management space, which is a career that can give you a lot of flexibility depending on the type of organization you're with. But has all of this been planned out or is it just kind of come as you as you found it? I would not say it's I think big picture it's been planned out and that I, as I mentioned, I wanted financial stability. So I knew I wanted to pursue a career that would give me the highest odds of success right. and, and kind of match itself up with my personality, of course, and my skill set. And so that's that's what landed me at UT. That's what landed me in the financial profession at large. I, I really um I it resonated with me, the type of work that you do in that industry. Right. Uh, as you noted, Dimensional was where I, I, I started my career and um, that fit perfectly with what I wanted because I love that this idea that an investment experience doesn't have to be this stressful jumping into the market, jumping out of the market, picking stocks, getting it right, getting it wrong. You know, you didn't, you could take all of that out of the equation and right. still have a really successful investment experience. So that all resonated with me quite well. And I enjoyed, I, I always like to say, I deeply enjoyed my time at Dimensional. I think when people hear that I took a gap year, the assumption is always, oh, well, you hated your life. You know, you wanted yeah, to burn out. Yeah, burn burn out. out. Exactly. Which, you know, is certainly common. I'm not saying that that isn't a reason that a lot of people choose a similar path. Right. Um, wasn't the path for me though. For me, it was more so I, I wanted that richness of experiences and I wanted to, to have that before retirement. I didn't want to put that off. So right. um, that the gap year certainly wasn't something that I planned out well in advance. And we can kind of talk about how, how I arrived at that decision, how my husband and I arrived at that decision. Um, when it comes to where I am now as a financial advisor, it actually wasn't the path at all. In mm. fact, I kind of took this this career break uh, as an opportunity to reassess my priorities and maybe open myself up to entirely different career paths. Right. It just so happened that through that experience, it kind of brought me back to where I was in just a slightly different way, right? I worked with financial right. advisors in my last role. Right. This time I realized I'd like to play a more direct role in kind of shaping other people's financial lives through a, a advisor role like this. Yeah, well, it's it's um, you, there's a couple of things there I'd like to ask about or at least draw out. One is obviously uh, being with Dimensional and understanding uh, the process that firms like Dimensional use. Um, it 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 really is all about trusting markets and and not thinking you're in control and and only focusing on those things you do actually have control over, which is incredibly freeing. Um, and most people don't know that. I mean, most people think that you've got to work a lot harder uh, to capture, you know, market results. And the reality is you almost have to work less if you, you just have to work smarter mm -hmm. uh, in terms. And so it's interesting that you, you did find yourself at a firm that supported a philosophy that would give your clients today and in the future, as well as your advisor clients, um, freedom to go pursue their passions, whether it's travel or family or uh, causes that mean something to her. So that's that that's pretty cool. The other thing I, th I think I mentioned or think about a lot is, you know, when, pe when young people get out of college and start their first career, I don't find that many people late in their career that could have predicted the path it was going to take. So I think sometimes you just got to get in the game and have a, a curiosity about things. And then your passions will rise up with, with curiosity. Now, you have some unique skills because obviously with Dimensional, you were coaching advisors, you were making presentations, you were uh, you were a, you ended up being a consultant to firms like mine, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and obviously you're a terrific uh, presenter and, and public speaker. How did you hone your writing skills? Did that come just by trial and error? And how long have you had the blog? Certainly trial and error. <laughs> um, okay. It's always, it's, uh, it's been a personal passion of mine since a very young age, actually writing. And in fact, I even considered, you know, taking a career in journalism or in something that was more writing heavy, but going back to that, um, that kind of keen desire to have Security. financial stability. Yeah. It's like, I can't do it. I can't, I, there's too much variability around a, a career, which is sad. And, you know, some people might say, why didn't you pursue that passion, whatever, but it, it just kind of didn't feel as practical to me to achieve that need. So it's always been an interest of mine. Um, and it's been really fun to kind of reignite that interest. And that's something that was kind of a tangential benefit of taking this time off from my career at Dimensional because, yeah, most of my writing was more business-like in nature, you know, writing emails. Right. I wasn't doing any right. kind of creative, creative or long-form writing yeah. in that in that role. When I got to take time away, it, it gave me space mentally and, and literally to to um, to start writing more and, and to do the travel blog and things like that. And so that's kind of the side benefit of taking a step back, especially when you're slightly younger rather than in retirement, because it gives you an opportunity to kind of reset and say, OK, maybe this this thing that I kind of put it to the, you know, to the back burner of my life right. as I built my career Maybe this really is my passion and maybe there's an opportunity to pivot more deeply into that passion before I feel like it's too late. And then I have to harbor regret about not pursuing something that I loved. Yeah. Well, it takes a lot of courage to invest seven years in a career and then just take a year off, not knowing when you come back, if you have an opportunity or not <laughs> uh, to provide that security. So tell me about the process and, I, and how many countries did you visit during that year? It sounds crazier out loud <laughs> if I had. So we, we visited 33 countries wow. in, in one year, which um, I'll caveat that by saying some of those countries were like day trips, right? right. So I'm counting right. Vatican City and, you know, things right. like that. But yeah, it was it was quite a whirlwind. And, and all of those were across uh, predominantly Europe and Asia. So we kind of limited ourselves to those two continents. Gotcha. So seven years of dementia, you take this year off. How do you how do you come to the decision that you can actually do this? Because obviously, uh, I guess you're married at the time, and so your husband has to be all in on this as well. And how do you how do you prepare for that? You were you were going to allude to that earlier, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a there's a lot of long winded ways that I can answer this question. So I'll try and keep it as brief as possible, but. Uh, I'll say that it didn't come out of nowhere. It started with what I would consider to be a trial run, hmm. which happened during the pandemic. So okay. the gap year happened 2022 to 2023. Of course, the pandemic back in 2020. And like a lot of people, I think, you know, we were having an, an existential crisis as a couple of mm -hmm. you know, what's going on with the world and what are we doing? And we're living at the time in this high rise in Austin and not really getting the benefit of living that city life in that tiny apartment and paying the high rent. So my husband and I decided to cancel our lease. And while we had this interesting opportunity to work remotely, which in my role, I'd never had that opportunity before, we decided that we would just go live in Airbnbs across the Western US, oh. visit national parks, um, kind of do the only travel one could really do at that point in time. Right. Right. And it ended up being a fantastic experience. We really liked that. Um, that rhythm of kind of being in a one place for about a month at a time and experiencing these cities that we had previously only visited on like a long weekend. And now we got to experience them more deeply and kind of live like locals. Yeah. So we love that experience. And naturally coming out of that, we're like, well, is there an opportunity to kind of take that experience and blow it up on the global scale once the world started opening back up post COVID? And so that got our, our gears turning um, we had other things going on in our life, like we were buying a house. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of interesting timing around these big financial decisions. Um, and so once we kind of effectively drained our savings to buy this home in Austin, we realized that our next goal, we kind of aligned together as a couple, was to save up to do this one-year trip and kind of take that same approach, but apply it globally. So that's how we arrived at the decision. Also happy to talk a lot about kind of the considerations around 
risk and savings and and preparation and trade-offs. So happy to kind of go wherever you'd like to yeah, go. Yeah, why don't you go a little deeper on it? To explain, yeah. yeah, share some of that. Yeah, I, so I'm just I, trying to think in my head, you know, you're in your late 20s, you don't have children yet, um, but it does still cost you money to live. I mean, you got to pay for your health insurance and groceries and and uh, and and those kinds of things. Uh, and, you, and obviously, wherever you're living, whether it's travel or not, shelter, and the basics. But so how do you talk a little bit about the preparation and what it what it took? Yeah, so the preparation was. Um, pretty intense. I'm a very, I'm a very type A person, if that has already been evident. And so I, a lot of spreadsheets and planning out everything to the detail when it comes to insurance, of course, like that was a huge thing for us and just the financial planning and budgeting around this decision. So the way we arrived at it was basically taking a look at, we, we track all of our expenses and our cost of living in Austin. And we said, okay, we feel comfortable basically taking that amount and making that be our travel budget. Right. So roughly what we were spending in Austin, we were hoping to spend abroad. And thankfully, uh, this was a time, of course, as it still is today, where the U.S. dollar is really strong. And so, right. uh, and of course, the U.S. was experiencing really high inflation. And so it actually wasn't too painful of a savings that we needed to build up in order to live a pretty comfortable life, especially yeah. in lower cost of living places we visited, like um, Hungary and Thailand and yeah. um, a lot of different places. So that's kind of how we thought about saving. Um, we're very, you know, we live modestly, so we're good savers. That wasn't too painful of a process for us. Um, then we also had to think about our house. <laughs> so right. big Maintain asset that we bought. When you're not in it. Yeah. Right. So we ended up doing the Airbnb route. So that was kind of my my job while we were traveling. In oh, addition okay. to blogging, was right. uh, remotely managing our house as an Airbnb, which primary goal was to make up like 80% of our mortgage. We ended up making a profit, which was a nice wow. little bolster in addition. Yeah. Um, so if anyone's ever considering that, happy to walk through the pros and cons of the Airbnb process, but it ended yeah. up being a positive experience for us. Um, then thankfully, on top of all this, my we planned as if my husband and I both wouldn't earn income. Um, my husband at the time had actually started his own company as a startup and it was remote first. Obviously, anyone who's related to the startup world, you know, you don't you can't really count on that income. You don't know what's going to happen. But we ended up being lucky in that his business has been successful and he was able to earn an income and work while we were traveling. Oh, okay. So he was, he was, and you were, and you were basically just doing the tripping millennial and the Airbnb kind of thing. Exactly. And, and then I was also the de facto travel planner for the yeah. two of us. So yeah. credit card point management and all of those things that, that ended up being my job while he was working his actual job. And that kind of gave me interesting insight into what does it mean to work, you know, American hours while you are in Japan, for example. And so really interesting challenges we worked through there, but came in on the other end of it. Yeah. Well, this this might be way too big a question, but are there a couple of life lessons from the nomadic Airbnb experience as well as the whirlwind tour? And I guess it wasn't a whirlwind tour because you, you went to a lot of countries, but it sounds like the goal was to not be at a hectic pace. That was the goal. Okay. The problem, <laughs> uh, there are some life lessons. I'm happy to share that. But the, yeah. What's, uh, what's, t what's difficult uh, we found is that, um, you know, it's most countries are so different, especially in Europe. It's so different from the U S and that, you know, it's a, I live in the middle of Texas. Like it is a slog for me to get anywhere outside of Texas. I have to be on a flight for at least a couple of hours or driving for at least six hours to get right. just to another state. Whereas we found ourselves often in Europe where we're realizing, hey, another country is like an hour train ride away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what happened is, is though we had all intentions to stay in one place for weeks at a time, uh, what often happened is we realized that we could kind of tack on a couple in just a few short days. And so that's kind of how our numbers started to creep up pretty dramatically there. Yeah. But we did still have, um, we stayed over a month and I believe four different countries. Okay. We did have some some places where we really got to know them on a deeper level. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of takeaways, uh, of course, I have a ton. Um, really, the the biggest one, I think, fundamentally, is that you know I, we think of ourselves Americans as so different from you know it's like what do we have in common with it 
a, a farmer in rural Vietnam? Or what do we have in common with somebody who works, uh, you know, at, at the docks in Montenegro? And it's like, what I found is that we're all just so much more similar than we are different. And it is a lot easier, even thinking about language barriers and cultural differences, it's just so much easier to connect with people from all different backgrounds and, and different nationalities than I ever would have imagined it to be. Oh, um, that's great. I thought it would be a kind of a lonely experience at times. And I was I was prepared for that. Um, but it ended up being a lot more welcoming and and yeah, just wholesome overall <laughs> than I than I even imagined it. So that was a really big life lesson and a, a reason why I think that travel just makes us better humans because it makes us more empathetic to other people and, and other you know nationalities, like I said. Yeah. Um on a more practical note, a couple of practical things that I took away is one that we just really don't need as much stuff as we think mm. we do. Mm. I I started this trip with two, uh, one giant checked bag, one fully uh, like packed carry on and a backpack. And I ended the trip with just one carry on <laughs> realized through time that we just really don't need the stuff that we need, uh, yeah. in order to kind of survive. And so what's interesting is I was really scared about being on the road with, you know, a couple suitcases for a long period of time at the right. outset. When I came home to my home in Austin, I was so stressed out about the fact that I have to maintain this house full of stuff. Right. Um, so that was it was a really interesting takeaway for me. And it's kind of helped me to keep my physical possessions kind of minimal and, and right. very important to me if I do hold on to them. Right. And then a third lesson um, that that I love is more just related to the nature of experiences and what they can offer us. And this has also been bolstered, not just by my own experience, but by research that I've read uh, in recent months, which is that experiences, when you think about how you spend your money, they kind of have this interesting triple benefit. Hmm. And in the financial planning world are almost related to like an HSA, where it's like triple tax exempt. I'm, right. I'll work out an analogy for that. <laughs> probably right. soon. But it's this idea that like, you get really excited in most cases to plan a trip. So you're kind of getting this positive benefit as you're looking forward to a trip that you've planned. For example, for me, anytime I have a trip coming up now, I set a picture of that destination as my computer background. Mm. So every time I log into my computer, I'm reminded like, hey, yeah. I'm going to Vail tomorrow. You're already like, taking the trip mentally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're already taking the trip mentally. You're prepping for it. You're excited for it. Then obviously while you're on the trip, you're experiencing it. You're having a good time. You're trying new foods, experiencing new cultures. Like there's an obvious benefit in the moment, but then you also get this benefit on the back end and perpetuity, which is that you can remember that trip, recall funny moments, even stressful or painful moments, because there's always stressful and painful moments, especially when you travel internationally, yeah. you missed a train, you, you know, messed up a conversion with my, whatever it is. But even those moments, I think we look upon fondly through time. And so travel and experiences give us this interesting benefit of leading up to it in the moment and after the fact that you don't always get with other purchases that you make in life. And so that has already been so evident to me as I've been calling upon all of these memories we've made over the last year, time and time again, it's, it's just reiterating to me how valuable that experience is. And I've right. zero regrets about you know, some people might think that's a poor use of money when it could be compounding for years to come. And, and certainly I, I understand that that's, that's part of my job, but there's also a compounding benefit of those memories. And, and I'm grateful. And I, I, I derive a lot of value from that. Yeah. And in the person that you become changes with these kinds of experiences too, which yeah. I think is what, what growth looks like. Um, yeah, I might come, I might come back to that concept about the three benefits in a moment, because I, I think about that as I as I plan travel. But um, let me get to this series of ideas. I know it had to be 25 years ago. It might have been longer. I saw Ken Dykewall speak. He has an organization called Age Wave and done tons of research and literature about the aging of our workforce. And of course, in the old world, we had a, a, a learning quarter. So, you know, you're getting educated the first 25 years or so of your life. And then we had a working half. So about 50% of our life we're working. And then you finally get to the finish line and you get another quarter of leisure and re traditional retirement. 
And he was writing about this over 25 or 30 years ago. And he said, look, the world is changing and the workforce is changing. And so more people are wanting more of that fourth quarter throughout their life. So why do you have to wait to the to the last quarter of your life to have these experiences? So I, I think your life might, in the way you've ordered some of your decisions, is is kind of evidence of that. Do you agree, or do you sound, or does that sound yeah. totally off off base? A hundred percent agree. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what I did, right? I kind of took a year of my retirement and just moved it up to my late twenties, and I think similar to him, I think that approach makes a lot of sense in the modern world. There's, I don't see why we have to be so prescriptive with kind of that quarter system. I don't see why we can't take a year off every few years to travel or pursue another hobby or start a business, whatever it is. Yeah, I think we should afford ourselves that opportunity and recognize that the the nature of work and the nature of the career path is evolving. That's and right. that um, is easy for me to say now. It took me a long time to kind of internalize that, uh, right. that idea of how work should work because I was a very, I, I wanted a traditional, ambitious, normal career path uh, for almost my entire life until I kind of came to this realization over time. And I will say part of that realization, if we jump back to the pandemic, was this fear that maybe you don't get that that last mm. quarter that you thought you would, right? right. right? There's, there was so many, I mean, there's so much horrible news, of course, at that time that we were surrounded by, but something that really stuck out to me were these tragic stories of people who did exactly what they were supposed to do. All they planning. did the first quarter, they right. worked their whole lives, they probably deferred a lot of enjoyment for retirement and travel and passions because they knew that if they did all those right things and they would... They would deserve that. They would have earned that right. Um, and they did. However, the unpredictable nature of life meant that they didn't get to see the fruit of all of that labor. Right. And those stories were deeply frightening to me yeah. that, that that was even a possibility of what could happen. And again, it kind of just brings into like this existential crisis that I think a lot of people felt. Yeah. And so what I am now passionate about is like, obviously I understand that deferring enjoyment is a good thing. Like we, we can't do everything now. <laughs> we can't spend all our money now and, and not be able to retire because that's not a good outcome. But I also really don't think it's a good outcome to completely defer all of our enjoyment until retirement because we're not promised that. That's that we, Nobody says you definitely get to make it to retirement. So finding ways to kind of sprinkle in retirement throughout your career seems like a reasonable approach to me. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, it's countercultural in our industry because our industry is all about gathering more assets and to save, you know, to save, save, save for the future. And I think it's enlightening to have advisors like your firm that are supporting, you know, go consume, go do things, not frivolously, but things that give you meaning. Mm -hmm. And so be really discerning about what really gives you meaning and those are actually excellent investments in your experiences. Um, but again, y y you know, I guess every, our industry is not always geared toward that. And when you look at the advertisements, it's all about, you know, it's, it's all about the whale jumping off, you know, jumping out of the ocean <laughs> when you're, you know, 65 or 70 years old. It's, it's not the, it's not the 40 year old doing, you know, taking a little bit of that throughout their career. The yeah. other thing that occurred to me with well, two other things that occurred to me as you were talking Culture matters a lot. So if you're in a culture of an organization or a friend group where everyone is chasing um, accolades and the titles and um, and more income, um, the choice you made sacrificed some of that intentionally. And I, I think it's dangerous. You've got to you've got to be aware of the culture you're in to see if you get sucked into the comparison game, because if you're playing the comparison game and you're, you're saying, okay, where am I at age 40 versus my peer at age 40, your life choices matter. Um, and then, the, and then the final thing about taking it early, I think as young people build their careers, it's, it's really a lot to do. I think it has a lot to say with, um, 
you know, I think retirement can be a dirty word because if you're doing work that gives you meaning, why would you stop? So mm -hmm. maybe you take more life early, but you keep adding value and creating value in the marketplace much longer because it's not really work. You're doing things you like to do. So anyway, I'm, I'm editori uh, doing a little editorial here on some of your <laughs> comments, but all of that was really, was really, was really helpful. Um, you know, you, you, you bring about these choices about deferring. You're familiar with the fire movement, I assume. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I can't even remember what that stands for. I know retire early. Financial but, independence, retire yeah, financial early. independence, retire yeah. early. There we go. So that whole mindset is all about just sucking it up early in your career. So you can have leisure later in your career. So some of this, this idea that you're discussing sounds to me sort of the counter argument. Would you agree with that? Or I would, you know, it's like live and let live. If that's, if that's really what you want to do, you know, who am I to say you shouldn't, but I, personally have a lot of issues with the fire movement and that's been really popular amongst my kind of yeah. generation and demographic. Right. I think the people, like, I think it's a positive thing on its face. It's being very intentional about your money and financial decisions, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. But I think what people who are very strictly adhering to that movement don't fully appreciate is kind of the opportunity cost, right? What are you giving up in order to achieve that? And so for example, like I think somebody who was a big fire person would probably say, no, you shouldn't go get like your weekly latte at a coffee shop with your friends because you can make coffee at home for cheaper. Or, you know, no, you shouldn't go on that ski trip with your friends because skiing is really expensive and, you know, you can s save that money and it'll compound, et cetera. And it's like, yes, that, you know, from a logical perspective, yes, that's correct. But what you're missing out on are, certain experiences and relationship building that may not be available to you whenever you actually do have that financial independence. And right. that's something that's really key to me. Like I think about, um, I often refer back to this kind of silly trip that I took when I was probably 23, maybe probably younger, maybe 22 years old. So I had like no money at the time, right? I had just started working, paying student loan debt, all of that. And my friends and I took a weekend trip to Vegas, of course, what you do when you're 22 years old. <laughs> and, you know, we had no business spending money going to Vegas and staying at a nice hotel on the strip. Like that, we should not have done that, financially speaking. A fire movement person would say, absolutely not. But we talk about that trip, you know, right. we're in our 30s now. We talk about that trip all the time. And yeah. guess what? We would not go on that trip right. now. Not a chance. Right. And so there's certain experiences that you can really only have at certain stages of life that you can't go back and get after you've been saving up. That's right. Um, ski trip is kind of another example. I mean, a lot of people ski well into retirement. But not everyone has the physical mobility right. and desire to ski in retirement. And so there are, I'm very cognizant of the fact that there's certain experiences that kind of have an more or less an expiration window. Right. And if you're deferring everything until retirement, it's it's going to expire and you're just not going to have that experience in your life. Yeah, that's very insightful. Well, now that you're in a more traditional firm, at least in terms of, um, uh, you, you know, you're, you're delivering value to clients every day and, and they call you and have questions once in a while, so you have to be accessible. Right. Um, how do you balance all this? Because you're still writing your blog, which is terrific. You're, you know, you're traveling and experiencing things. And of course you're serving your clients with excellence. How do you balance all that today? It is challenging. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, it, it certainly helps that we don't have kids. Like, I think that would be a, a much, it's almost like the time that I think would be naturally being spent. If I were parenting a child right now right. is being spent on kind of these, these extra things. So I think where it'll really get squeezed is when we decide to have children and maybe, maybe the, the tripping millennial might have to take a bit of a back seat because yeah. obviously my, my chief important goal is working with clients. Like that's where I get the most satisfaction. Right. That is my, you know, quote unquote, nine to five, if you will. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's challenging. It's, it's definitely, um, it's thankfully reached a point where I, only really need to post a couple of times a week in order to kind of keep my audience like slowly snowballing, if you will. Yeah. That's one thing I've learned about content creation. It's um, it's a lot of 
in order to kind of build your audience, it's a lot of upfront work. So I was posting a lot while we were traveling, but once you could have reached that critical mass of an audience and they're engaged and you know that they're kind of aligned with the type of content that you're creating, you can, it's a little bit easier to kind of pair it back at that point. And you don't feel like, you know, wild need to be posting at, you know, a crazy three times a day clip. So thankfully it's been, it's been okay, but yeah, it's uh, that and, and studying for the CFP, as you know, I've been doing uh, yeah, stuff for a, busy that's a lot. here. Yeah. You know, as we, as we age and mature and have children and make other choices in our lives, um, you, you know, some of the, the highest and best use of your time does change a bit. And the key, I guess, is just being intentional about, you know, um, what you can outsource and what you can't. I mean, you can't outsource the things that only you can do. And obviously, as a parent to your child, I mean, only you can do that yeah. and, and and care for them and love them a certain way and and and, and influence them the way the, the way that they they need you as a parent. Uh, but there are a lot of other things you can outsource. I know I had Ashley Willens, who is a professor at Harvard, who wrote a great book called Time Smart, talked about getting value from investing in help in things that are not. So I, I got a feeling you'll probably figure this out because it sounds like you're pretty good. You're pretty good. You're a pretty good planner. I'll have to listen. Uh, to so, podcast so <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's get into travel a little bit. You know, I've been, I was accused by my family years ago of being a Clark Griswold, you know, the, the character from the vacation movies that mm-hmm. had everything, every, everything planned out to the minute and over planning. And so when I do a trip, I like to plan a lot for the reasons you mentioned. I enjoy taking the trip before I take the trip. Um, so what about you? Are you a, are you a really detailed planner on buying tickets in advance and where you've got to be and where you got to stay and catching the right train? Or are you more of the just show up at a location and, and see what happens? <laughs> I'm somewhere in between. I think I, I used to be the, I am the Excel spreadsheet girl. You know, okay. it's, it's the person where if you're going to a destination, I had a spreadsheet for it and I'll send it to you. And um, I, you know, it was detailed down to the exact minute of the train, like you say. Through the experience of traveling long term, that changes things, right? You can't, you can't be that detailed when you're yeah, traveling. You know. well, yeah. It's possible. You would absolutely go crazy. And so that experience really opened me up to finding the the balance between not being totally um, unplanned because I found when I did that, I would leave a destination and then find out about something after the fact and be like, Mm. wow, I can't believe we didn't do that one critical thing that we should have done there. That's silly of us. But then at the same time, when things were really well detailed, I realized that we were kind of missing out on this beautiful kind of serendipitous nature of travel that happens. And oftentimes the most memorable experiences for me uh, were the ones that were unexpected, right? It's the things that you didn't know about this restaurant or you didn't know about, you know, this particular neighborhood and you experienced it. And it kind of even has greater value to you because you didn't have any expectations that were built up. Right. It's a huge thing with travel, especially in social media nowadays, expectations versus reality, yeah. A lot of us go in with a lot of ideas about what a place should be because we've been inundated with right. images and videos. Yeah. So yeah there's we actually walk some the streets on Google Maps, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's actually this, there's a syndrome, I think, in psychology. It's called the Paris syndrome. And it's basically that idea of so many people go to Paris because they have this idea of what it should be. It's the, you know, and they're disappointed. And, and they're disappointed. Yeah. It's it's almost inevitable because it's so hard to live up to that. So um, yes, it has evolved. What I do now, kind of a practical tip, is that I basically will gather recommendations, you know, neighborhoods, restaurants, bars, coffee shops, whatever, and I'll add it all to a Google map. And I don't necessarily make reservations or an itinerary. I might say, yeah, I kind of want to be in this area today. I kind of want to be in that area tomorrow. And what I'll do is I'll kind of wander aimlessly But then occasionally look at my map and say, oh, this place that I had pinned is right around the corner. Like I can go check it out if I want to, you know, but I don't have to, I don't feel feel like the need to go there if there's something else more interesting. Exactly. Exactly. There's a, there's this phrase that my husband and I would always use, which is like, never leave a good time in pursuit of what you think is going to be a better time. Oh, that's great. It's, you don't know, right? So like, if you're having a good time, don't cut it short. There's no reason that you should cut it short because chances are the thing that you think is going to be a better time isn't actually going to be a better time. Say that again, Rachel. 
Yeah. Never leave a good time in pursuit of what you think is a better time. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's always wanting to be where you're not, you know, cause you're, yeah. I mean, that's the danger of planning too much. Yeah. Well, well, that, well, that was helpful. Now you mentioned on your, on your blog that you are really into places that aren't quote touristy. And, um, you know, we did an Italy trip a few years ago and I got the Rick Steves book that's about that thick and has Love a million it. things to do in Italy. And, and I was not Clark Griswold on this trip. I did a really good job, kind of like you did. I at least knew what was where, and we, 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 we didn't go to a lot of things. But we didn't go to a lot of places that were off the beaten path. So what? tell me about that. What, how do you – where have you been that's kind of off the beaten path, or, or, or what does that mean? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say, first of all, I love Rick Steves. Like I, and so it's, I, I like places that are off the beaten path, but I think Rick Steves, something about him, his – Personality. We yeah, my husband and I, yeah. we actually listen to anytime we go to a new city uh, in Europe, we'll start almost day one every single time with his audio walking tour to kind of get a, a oh feel. really wow we do yeah I, I I people think it's corny I'm like I adore it because it kind of gives me a sense of places that I want or areas I want to return to and gives me a sense of the history that you don't always get just kind of wandering around a place yeah uh, on your own so I appreciate Rick Steves I think there is absolutely a place for that. Okay, we um, yeah. need to reach out to Rick and get him to sponsor your blog. Maybe get a ad on your blog. <laughs> no, it would get be a, a dream revenue here. <laughs> it would be a dream come true. Um, but yeah, so yeah, to my point earlier, like I think some of the most memorable and magical places are uh, are the unexpected places, right? And so, um, if if I could think of, I'm trying to think of like ex specific places I would mention. Usually, what it translates to, like without giving specific names, is what I would consider to be like second or maybe third cities. It's gotcha. going to, you know, a place like Rome, for example, but then also going to Orvieto outside of that or going into like a smaller town in Tuscany, like, or it's going to uh, one that I really loved was going to Hong Kong. So obviously Hong Kong, big tourist destination, but then going to this little beach town called Sheko, mm. which is, I had to take like an hour long bus ride outside of the city to go to this really amazing kind of idyllic beach town it was really quiet and lovely. So how did you find uh, out? Of uh, well, thankfully, actually, I had um, I had a friend who lives in Singapore. And so they uh -huh. had some great recommendations in Southeast Asia. Gotcha. Um, so that's yeah, it's it, some of it's kind of peer to peer based. Some of it's just looking on a map and being like, that kind of looks like an interesting place and and figuring it out. But yeah, a lot of times it's these kind of second cities. Yeah. Um, and then it's also building in, which I would always recommend is building in a little bit of unstructured walking time, especially if it's a big city. Um, Osaka, I remember doing that. I, I just walked around a quieter neighborhood in Osaka, not on any you know tourist maps or anything like that. Hardly anyone on the streets, but it was one of, you know, it's randomly something that I still think about to this day. It was so pleasant to kind of not have Google Maps directing every turn that I take. Yeah experiencing places like that and seeing the cherry blossoms and seeing an old Japanese couple like sitting on a bench under the trees and watching people play tennis. It's just those kind of observations, I think, are some of the beauty of travel too. So when you open up your itinerary to allow yourself to move slower and be more observant, hmm. I think you'll be surprised at kind of the things that you come away from, from the experience. Yeah. Well, and that's and that's really the benefit too of being in certain places for longer. You don't feel like you got to yeah. fill up the itinerary because you're, you know, you can just go very slowly and go have a cup of coffee at the coffee shop and not feel like you've got to get to the Vatican tour, um, you know, at, at seven a.m. You know, for the first doors opening or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's that's helpful. Uh, I know this next question is totally unfair, but if you could only go to one place in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. Um, what might you choose? It is totally unfair. <laughs> and I, I fear that my answers will maybe disappoint, but I stand by them. So I'll explain, Let's I'll do explain it. why. Yeah. So uh, this one you'll, you'll already be familiar with. So if I had to go to one place in Europe, it's hard to beat Italy. It, it really is. Right. We, we spent, uh, we've been to Italy multiple times. We spent six weeks at the start of our trip in Bologna, hmm. um, which isn't always people's like first city they think the of. City of letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, known as the culinary capital of Italy. So if oh, you're really? a beauty in any regard, Bologna, I would say is as absolutely a must visit. But I think Italy as a whole is, is hard to beat just because you get such a vast 
range of landscapes. I mean, you have like the Dolomites and the Italian Alps in the north. Obviously, you have the beautiful beaches. You have the hills of Tuscany. It's just a lot that you can kind of be satisfied with uh, landscape wise, obviously, architecturally. It's beautiful, historically hard to beat as well. Um, and then the food and wine. Uh, you know, how, how do you get better than that? Right. Yeah, I think. Italy is also such a regional place, which you don't always get with other countries in Europe. I don't think people realize just how recently uh, Italy was unified as a country yeah. and how each of those regions has their own foods and in some cases own language and own culture. So I think Italy, you could spend a lot of time there over the years and, and kind of not get bored. Um, in fact, we're going to Sicily later this year, a, a region I've never been to. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited to experience that. Cool. Uh, so that's that's Europe. Of course, I could add so much more. Of course. Asia is a, is a hard one, too. Um, another perhaps somewhat obvious answer. Um, we visited Japan for the first time last year. And um, wow, I, it, it just blew me away. I had really high expectations of Japan. I'd wanted to go for years. It was a pandemic trip that got canceled in 2020. And I just really lived up to everything that I thought it would be. What I think is really interesting about Japan is that you get to see a very different approach to urban planning. Hmm. And urban planning is something that I became really fascinated by throughout these travels and understanding how our built environments can influence our communities and how we engage with one another. Um, and Japan just does such a good job of, you know, in a place like Tokyo, largest city in the world. 30 plus million people living there. When you walk in the streets, it, it doesn't feel overwhelming. Mm. It doesn't even necessarily feel like a New York scenario. I can't even fully explain it, but they have these places that are such human scale. Like it's like these tiny little places that are built. You don't have these big highways and cars everywhere. Like you see in America, very walkable, obviously a fantastic public transportation. So I think it's, if you have any kind of interest in urban planning and of course food, Japan is a, yeah. is a must visit. Cool. Um, and then the U S U S is an interesting one. I think a lot of people have asked me, you know, or a few people have asked me if domestic travel has kind of become not as interesting, you know, once you visit 30 plus countries, it's like, do you kind of not get jazzed about going to Utah or wherever you're going in the U S yeah. and, uh, there's a little bit of truth to that. Like, I think it's, mm. you don't really get the same spice and spark of, you know, having to navigate a foreign language, for example, or, right. you know, when you see the same chain restaurants that you see in your own backyard in a new city in the U S you know, it's not as interesting, but the U.S. obviously is still a fantastic place to travel. And I think what the U.S. really has that almost no other country has is just this amazing diversity of landscapes. Hmm. I mean, we have incredible natural beauty in the U.S. And our national parks, I think, are kind of second to nine compared to the rest of the world. So I don't know if I could pick one national park in the U.S. It's hard. Like I said, we spent most of 2020 traveling to many of them. But if you kind of look to the corner of like, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, the national parks in those areas, you know, Yellowstone, Glacier, Grand Tetons, Moab area, like those are some oh, really fabulous. amazing yeah. places to visit. So definitely worth seeing in your lifetime. Oh, very, very cool. Well, let's let's uh let's let's begin to bring the journey home here. You've been really <laughs> awesome uh sharing all of this and and your stories fascinating and I know you're just starting to write it really well. Um, so you're you're in the early chapters of your story. So I can't wait to see. Um, and I, and I'll 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 follow you obviously on your blog, and and hopefully we'll we'll meet up at a conference someplace. So Love just it. final tips or tools. Any particular other than Tripping Millennial blog, which everyone needs to subscribe to. Um, uh, any other particular travel sites or um, systems that you use that you'd recommend to our audience? I love using Google Maps, as I mentioned before, to kind of consolidate all of these different places, um, regardless of where the recommendations are coming from. I think that's where it should be stored which okay. for a lot of ease. Um, I'm not a huge fan of TripAdvisor uh, and, and those kind of sites, just because I think it, it doesn't really cater to what I'm trying to get out of a travel experience as much. I think it's right. great for hotels and tours, like for the touristy things, it's good. Yeah. But for like, you know, restaurants and things like that, it's not as great. 
Um, I love this app. It's it's kind of geared exactly for someone like me, but it's this app called Out of Office. Um, yeah. It's a female founded app um, geared towards mostly, I think, millennial women, but it's basically kind of like peer to peer sharing of recommendations. And so gotcha. um, it's it's kind of like a Google map of Google maps and it's showing everyone else's Google map together. So I really enjoy that. I value local um, and personal friend recommendations above all. So I think just, you know, find your most traveled friend and, and ask them what they think. And you've been here. Right. Yeah. And that shouldn't steer you wrong. And then, as I already said, like building in some flexibility, once you get those recommendations to kind of self-discover uh, usually leads, I think, to, to the best experiences. Oh, very cool. Well, this has been this has been awesome. So uh, how if our audience wants to find out more about you, your firm and and your blog, where do they where do they go or Instagram, yeah. whatever your whatever your <laughs> the best place to follow you? In true modern fashion, I'm all over the place. So you can find um, website wise, our, our firm's page is peltomacapital.com. Okay. Um, and so you could always schedule time if you want to chat uh, about anything, you can schedule time there with me. Um, I also maintain my own uh, social media channels and blog at Tripping Millennial okay. is the name of that. So TikTok and Instagram, uh, you can find me there as well. And then I also have most of my writing is in the form of my weekly newsletter. Letter called the travel edit, which is also on my website, trippingmillennial.com. And you can subscribe to that and it just gets. And you'll get it every Thursday. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thanks so much for your time. Um, I hope you guys found as much inter, uh, uh, enjoyment and, and, and learned something from this show as I did. I, I'm, um, you know, I love to travel. And, and again, the great thing about these types of conversations as we can travel from other people's experiences as well. But again, Rachel, you're very unique in, in being so intentional at a young age of building your life and your career around your, your passion. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Please leave comments or reviews at iTunes or Spotify. You can find the show at all the, 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 uh, the various streaming networks. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, uh, you can reach me at money and meaning at tandemgrowth.com. Uh, obviously, you can check out my book, The Money and Meaning Journey, uh, at all online retailers. And as I quoted Howard Thurman earlier, I, I sort of steal that quote again and just say, look, find what makes your high, uh, li uh, heart come alive and put the plans in place to go pursue it. Thanks all. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Money and Meaning Show with Jeff Bernier, a show dedicated to help you gain the confidence and freedom to lead a life of personal significance and help you get your actions and resources in alignment with what matters most. We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions for Jeff or comments on the show, feel free to reach out to us at moneyandmeaning at tandemgrowth.com. Or you can find us on the web at www.tandemgrowth.com. Jeff Bernier is the President and Chief Investment Officer at Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. This show is a production of Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC. All information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as specific financial, legal, or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Listeners should not rely on the content of this podcast as the basis for any investment decisions. A professional advisor should be consulted and or independent due diligence should be conducted before implementing anything discussed in this show. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, does not guarantee its accuracy and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. Tandem Growth Financial Advisors, LLC, does not make any representations or warranties as to the accuracy, timeliness, suitability, completeness, or relevance of any information prepared by any unaffiliated third party, such as guests on the podcast, and takes no responsibility for the same.